Sure. Hello, we're here with Bruce Harrell, who's running for Seattle mayor. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Well, thank you very much. And thanks for everyone introducing themselves. My name is Bruce Harrell and I'm running for a mayor of Seattle. And of course, everyone says, well, why are you, why are you running? So I pretty much got that down now. I've probably explained it thousands of times. But you know, I think that my, um, my proven track record, my values, um, what the city needs at this moment in time is really a, a perfect fit. Um, everyone just about has seen the George Floyd video at this time. And you should have been disgusted at what you saw. And everyone sees how fragile our society is, both life itself, uh, small businesses, um, family and friends with the COVID situation. Uh, we are at a pivotal moment in our city's history. And for those that don't know me, and I know many of you, and it's nice seeing many of you again. You know, I was born and raised in this city, and I, um, I sort of bring to some, some, some events this picture of my father when I was born, who was a IBEW, he's the one right here, IBEW 77 apprentice lineman when I was born here in Seattle, and my mother's a Japanese American was was interned when she was young and she met my dad when she was 14 and they were married and went to Garfield High School. So I came from very humble beginnings. But they taught me how to listen first, how to lead with humility, but also strength and aggressiveness. Um, I was the one who, 30 seconds. who banned the box for felons being asked can what crimes you've been committed during the job interview. Very controversial at the time. I was the one who introduced the race and social justice legislation in the city that required an equ equity lens and everything that they did. I've outlined, I outlined on my website what I will do as mayor, and I will introduce health care for all that I'd like to be able to elaborate a little bit more on. We'll start a Seattle Job Center. We will reform the police department like it's never been reformed before. I hear those lovely bells, and so I'll stop there, and hopefully I'll be able to answer some more during the questions. You never know if people hear it, so that's great. <laughs> All right, so uh, now we'll move into question one and I just posted it into the chat. Uh, these are part of the prepared questions. So the responses to these are one minute, I'm sorry, two minutes in length. And we'll start the first one with Mackenzie. Great, thank you. Uh... So uh, what specific actions will you take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and the long term? Uh, please address things such as land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services, the role of the police, and the justice system. I can repeat that if you want. I know it was a lot. Well, you sort of gave me some of the answers, but I'll, I'm ready. But don't start the clock yet. So... <laughs> Are we ready? I, had, I think I have those three, six areas that you covered. Okay, go ahead. So, so in your answer it is sort of, in the question is sort of the answers. Uh, we have the right policies in place and that's what a good city council does. Housing first. Don't move a person from one place to another, find them housing, build them housing, get them wraparound services. Um, whether it's drug and alcohol treatment, mental illness treatment, resume drafting, job preparedness, whatever they need, we have to meet them there and help them align themselves and re-enter society. We also have to accept the fact that there are some that may be chronic homelessness that just may need warm uh, water, heat, and, and shelter as well. So specifically, uh, we did adopt a regional approach and I'm all in on the regional approach because it's tough enough simply for a barista or a food service worker to live in Seattle. So when we build housing for them, we have to look at not just within the city, we have to also see what real estate uh, is there, is there at, at, as well. And we have to relax some of the, uh, I'll say the zoning or land use requirements to make sure that we can house people where we need to house them. What's different about my approach, because I would imagine everyone's going to say very similar situations. I've read probably everything I get my hands on on, on, on homelessness. I, I come from a data-based approach. And one thing I will do is make sure that whether it's a tax revenue, looking at the tax um, streams that we can't, that the state legislature has allowed us to do, or philanth uh, philanthropic dollars through corporations and their social responsibility goals, and whether it's private donations, we're going to open up a portal 
such that everyone could chip in, whether it's dollars, whether it's clothing, whether it's food, and we're going to become a compassionate city. And so we will be aggressive on tax revenues in addition to philanthropic dollars. Many of you know my wife was the CEO of United Way, and we are pretty good at raising funds and awareness. And so what we're going to do now is find an outlet by which everyone in this city can participate, and it's just not one person's problem. I will own the problem as mayor. The buck will stop with me and we will solve the problem. Great, thank you. So now we'll move into question two and I just posted that into the chat. Uh, Jeff, would you like to take that one? Sure, what is your strategy for creating dense and diverse neighborhoods and assuring affordable housing? How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements, redlining, including but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? Do you support and would you sign city legislation to end single family zoning as Berkeley, California recently did? So there's a lot to unpack there. So by way of values, what I value most is, um, this may be academic for some, but I actually grew up in a city that was redlined and that certain people of certain races could only live in a certain area. And I've done everything within my power to make sure that everyone has a pathway to success, particularly in terms of housing, um, housing for particularly African-Americans. And if you look at my diverse, my endorsement page, you'll see I have amongst all the candidates, all 16, the most diverse representatives and advocates supporting my candidacy, particularly because of my race and social justice work and my housing policies and climate justice and the other things that would make me attractive to these candidates. Now, more specifically about single family zoning, I don't dodge the question. I'm certainly not prepared to say that I would sign legislation um, to uh, er eradicate or to eliminate single family zoning. Uh, I will say that we will be very aggressive in terms of uh, density in, in areas where it makes sense immediately. And we've done studies to show where, whether it's transit oriented development, or other areas where we have under what I'll call low hanging fruit to achieve density. We will achieve affordability by increasing inventory. And that's why the work that you saw me do on accessory, accessory dwelling units, um, backdoor cottages, et cetera, was all part of a scheme to achieve affordability. Uh, we need more housing stock and how we go about it is part of a, a, a process and a plan, talking to communities, talking to uh, community advocates, talking to neighborhoods to see what makes sense. And that will be my approach. And I think we can achieve affordability. Like I said, I grew up in a city where baristas and teachers could live in Seattle. Now they cannot. So that will be uh, top on our list to make sure Seattle becomes more affordable. Thank you. Uh, question number three, Carrie. Hey there. Would you decrease the Seattle Police Department budget? And if so, approximately by what percentage? What is your plan for the city's SPOG negotiations? And do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? I'm sorry, you just cut out on the, the second. I heard after defund that it just cut out. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, by what percentage? And then what is your plan for the city's SPOG negotiations? And do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? Okay. Okay, so number one, um, I do not subscribe to a defunding model. And I'll just be very candid with you. And if you look at, again, my website where you see representatives from the NWCP and the Urban League and Blacks in Government, I was a president of um, the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, the largest in black fraternity, that what many communities want are effective, an effective police department with good response times. They do not want bad cops. They, they, we do not want bad cops and we want a complete culture change. And so how you go about that is yes, looking at every dime that is invested in the organization and making sure every dime gets the return on investment that we need. And so you do not start off with, in my leadership, with you defund them because we want seven minute response times, we want training, we want de-escalation masters. And so I don't think that funding it or defunding it is automatically answered, number one. Number two, um, you've heard me be very vocal about, I was the first one to propose body cameras as an example. 
you talk, you hear me talk a lot about the George Floyd video, and I've marched with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and community activists, making sure that we put first and for the, the we put we put the argument against unreasonable force at the top of our list. But we have to remember in the African American community and other BIPOC communities that once we eradicate unreasonable force, we still have disparities in health, in education, in housing, and many other barometers by which we have a rich culture. So my work in race and social justice, and again, I was the author of the race and social justice legislation. My work doesn't stop with just unreasonable force, just doesn't stop with having a good police department. It has to continue. That is a lower bar to achieve true racial uh, equity and equality for a community. My wife, who's an African-American uh, woman who came from limited means uh, like myself, we spend a lot of time mentoring uh, people and helping organizations achieve a higher level of success uh, because we believe that what we want are strong educational policies, strong health outcomes, strong mentoring policies, and you'll see all of that under the Herald administration. Great, thank you. And so now we'll move on to question number four, and I believe Summer is on that one. Hey, how will you prioritize transportation infrastructure for biking, pedestrians, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars? Which do you view as most important to prioritize funds for? Thank you for the transportation question. So we have outlined over years sort of a priority investments, but I don't think, at least I don't subscribe to the uh, the argument that um, one is more important than the other. I think you build for number one, carbon neutrality, and you, you, you try to get out of our fossil fuel sort of infrastructure latent thinking. And of course we build for tomorrow, which will be addressing the climate uh, uh, crisis. So as we build for uh, either electrical cars or bikes or mass transit or uh, light rail, light rail mobility, whatever we are building for, it's part of an ecosystem, a transportation ecosystem. Now you'll see that um, under my leadership when I was on the council, that that's exactly was my philosophy, that when you look at transportation needs, you also have to look at safety needs. So if you are too aggressive in one component and less aggressive in another, for example, bikes and cars, you have fatality. So I led the effort, for example, in our neck of the woods, on a road diet, and, I, and, and we have a heavy reliance on cars in the south end of Seattle. But I led the charge because I convinced people that building a slower, more bike-friendly and more pedestrian-friendly uh, transportation system made sense for the community. And there were countless meetings that I had to go to, and they see now that, quite frankly, our arguments were right. We had less fatalities and a better uh, infrastructure. So under my approach, we have a very balanced approach which I think is how you build a smart system and a smart transportation grid. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we're gonna move into the uh, follow-up questions and the responses to these are one minute apiece. Um, so board members, if you have any follow-up questions, you may raise your hand. And I can go with one. Actually, this one was asked by our environment committee. Uh, it said, um, how would you use your office to address climate justice, ensuring a healthy environment and access to climate, supporting solutions such as multimodal clean transportation options for all Washington residents? Yeah. The first thing when I deal with transportation issues or climate issues, sorry, that's still stuck on the transportation question. I look at how a person lives their life. So I was one of the first investors in electrical vehicles, I have solar in the house, I'm sort of OCD and recycling, and I try to live a very environmentally friendly lifestyle and teach that uh, to our three kids. Um, if you look at, uh, again, what, we, what I did when I was on the council to make sure that we uh, met our carbon neutrality goals and what I did for Seattle City Lights, you may recall that I was the one that proposed that all of our LED lights in our city that are now all LED or street lights converted to street lights as opposed to high pressure sodium. I looked at the cost, the, the, um, the environmental effects of some of our high pressure sodium. In seconds. Um, oh, I forgot these are the shorter ones. And I became a climate sort of crisis 
policy leader on the council in a lot of our um, climate plans. I think when I first uh, announced, I think I was the only one to put a climate plan plan on their website. And I think others have followed. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot those were one minute, so I'll shorten my answers for these. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Thanks so I'm much. Still in my two minute mode. <laughs> Um, Mackenzie, go ahead with the next one. Thanks. Um, last week, Tacoma announced that they are going to start launching a pilot program for universal basic income. And uh, while a, a big majority of that is going to be donation based, I'm curious if that is something that you would be interested in trying to implement in Seattle. And if so, if you have any ideas and plans towards doing that and to how to pay for something like that. Yeah, so I've looked at in uh, the mayor's race to New York, which is getting a lot of attention. I looked at uh, the candidate Yang come out with his UBI, UBI platform. And quite honestly, it's quite intriguing. Um, I, I, I'm very supportive of the concept. We'll, we'll no doubt want to be a leader in this arena. I quite, quite candidly, um, I did hear one other candidate mention it in one of the forums. And I really am excited about UBI as a platform. So uh, because, because that is not coming up so much on the, 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 uh, the, the platform right now, I'm not being asked a lot of questions about it. I'm not coming up with a hard UBI platform, but I got to tell you, it's quite intriguing. I'm very interested in possibly supporting it. And I will probably come out with something relative in the next couple of weeks on UBI. Great. Thank you. Summer, go ahead. I um, heard your answer earlier about um, kind of all throwing in for a city where we take care of each other. And then I also saw somewhere else, and so wanted to give you an opportunity to address this. I saw somewhere else where you said that you didn't think that taxes needed to be raised or rev we needed to raise any further revenue for um, homelessness. And so wanted to see if, is, is that an accurate statement of your um, position on, how to pay for homelessness. So I've never said that taxes were not necessary and there will be no taxes. And I think someone either misquoted me or flat out um, said something I didn't say. So you've never heard me say that. What you have heard me say is that one of our biggest problems in Seattle, and I've been in Seattle my entire life, is most people do not know the entry point on how to help, how to give, what do they do? There are people with a lot of discretionary Fortunately or unfortunately, Seattle is one of the richest um, uh, cities in the country. King County, Snohomish County are among the 10 most wealthy counties in the country. So what I proposed was we capture as much of that as possible, but certainly we will look at new revenue streams. Um, for example, I was the lead negotiator on the minimum wage when everyone seemed to be against it. I was, I was one of the lead negotiators. When we look at uh, aggressively trying to capture as many taxes as we possible, there would be a process, but certainly the state legislature has given us tools to increase taxes, to get that sustainable tax revenue, and certainly we will explore all possibilities. Great, thank you. Any further uh, follow-up questions? Oh, go ahead, Summer. I had a follow-up question to that. Uh, I, you just mentioned the state legislature and some options. Can you be more specific about what tax revenues would you raise um, to be able to help with our homelessness crisis and any other um, issues that we need to address in Seattle? Well, we have, as you well know, the jumpstart tax that is already in place. There's a little snag on the lit litigation. But I think that was an excellent start at trying to start the ball rolling in terms of tax revenue. So what I would also suggest, however, is that in addition to that, we still aggressively pursue philanthropic means. When you look at a company like Amazon, and I've said this publicly, that their revenues are approximately $17 million per, per, per hour, per hour. And they are causing devastation to a lot of small businesses and a lot of uh, infrastructure in many small business dis districts um, and downtown Seattle. So part of my plan are to make sure that yes, we look at taxes, taxes such as the jumpstart tax that was done, but we also make sure that we can uh, capital gains taxes. One example is I'm extremely supportive of that. And our whole tax system that's very regressive, I think we need to pick it apart and start looking at as many progressive tax streams as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, Barbara, go ahead. Uh, 
Can, can, can You're her... on mute, Barbara. Thank. Sorry. So I'm interested in our heritage community facilities that we used to call proudly the Emerald Necklace and all of our parks and community centers, which by virtue of the last 20 years of very, very stingy budgeting are crumbling. They're absolutely crumbling. And they're getting an, a huge amount of extra use from the flood, the high tide of homelessness. How do you think about that heritage asset and the, it, the, its current uh, status and the extra care, the extra use that it's getting and the needs of future citizens as a kind of budgeting and city making issue. So if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, um, for me, it's inhumane to allow people to live in tents without heat, without water, in parks with those, not with those kinds of amenities. I will do everything possible to make sure they are housed. And that's why I support the housing first approach. Our, our green space, our open spaces, those things, those assets that we pay with tax dollars need to be preserved for our next generation, for our enjoyment of life. So therein lies the balance. And so I think I'm one of the few candidates that would say, you know, I lead with compassion. I lead with love. I don't, I'm not an angry person, but I also have to sort of preserve the sanctity of, of, of certain areas that people want to enjoy. Uh, I will be aggressive in making sure we preserve our gems, but equally aggressive, make sure people are housed. And I don't think that by saying that we're preserving green space and open space and parks and, and areas like that, that we're less compassionate for people that unfortunately are uh, unsheltered and, and housed. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, that looks like time. Would you like to go ahead with a one minute wrap up? Sure. Well, number one, thank you for taking the time. Those are some outstanding questions. And since we asked a lot of tax questions, I want to make one thing crystal clear. You know, I could read a profit loss statement and I could read a balance sheet. I spent most of my life helping small businesses. And what I'm concerned about is always that balance because we have many businesses that are leaving Seattle, a lot of small businesses that are failing. So what I try to do is figure out how much revenue we need money we can create, whether through a, an aggressive tax strategy or a philanthropic strategy. And I'm probably the only one of these candidates who will talk about that because my wife and I have, have experienced raising. We've raised over $100 million when she was the CEO of United Way. And so I want to capture as much revenue as possible because at the end of the day, we should not treat anyone like we cannot house them. So my goal is not to run small businesses out of the city and set up camps somewhere else. My goal is to make sure everyone can stay here and we can house the homeless. And so I, if you, you, you guys talk about embracing race and social justice, okay, then look at my website and see the things we're creating because that is truly a movement on race and social justice. So I'd ask that you support our candidacy, because that's probably the best thing you could do if you're truly trying to support race and social justice. Ours is a movement different than anyone else's that's running. Great, thank you so much.